I'm Greg DePama. You're listening to Prime Sports Tennis with Andrea Leanne on the Prime Sports Radio Network. On today's show, the Pro Tours are back in full swing, and we're going to tell you who's back on the court for action, including Serena and Abu Dhabi. Simona Halep is looking for some respect. Just ask the ITF or Adidas why she's not their first choice. We've got tournament updates and event previews to begin the 2018 season. Your Facebook questions and more as Prime Sports Tennis on Prime Sports Network starts now. All right, it's Tuesday, the 26th of December, 2017, and we hope everybody had a great Christmas. Thanks again for tuning in to Prime Sports Tennis with PSN Tennis Editor and former Top 15 player in the world, Andrea Leand. Andrea, good talking to you again. Merry Christmas. Well, Merry Christmas to you. Happy holidays to everyone. What a terrific uh, last week it's been. A lot going on. As you mentioned, Serena Williams has taken a, we'll call it a wild card, into an exhibition in Abu Dhabi. She's going to play Yelena Ostapenko. This is the first foray back on the court since uh, giving birth to her baby Olympia. And, of course, this is putting a little bit more uh, uh, ease to those who are wondering if she's going to play the Australian or not. Is she going after that record already to get those last two Grand Slams to break Margaret Court? And uh, I think it's a good sign, Greg. I think everyone's cautious, though, that to me it's a trial run. They're going to see where she is, how she's playing, how she feels. This is the first time she's traveling outside the country. Of course, uh, baby Olympia is uh, was apparently still breastfeeding, if we can say that. So, you know, obviously there's a lot going on when you're a first-time mother. This is the very, very first time a player has uh, tried to come back from a birth of a child uh, this soon. We've seen, uh, of course, Van Gogh on Cauley. We've seen Kim Clasters. We've seen uh, a number of players come back after the having a child, but never this soon. It's always been a year or two years, and they've been much younger when they've had uh, their babies, usually in the mid-20s. And so this is a first. Uh, Serena Williams is trying to do uh, something again unprecedented and trying to uh, set an, another record, if you can say that, in the coming back after only four months. So to me, there's no pressure on her, Greg. There's no pressure at all, no expectations. Of course, she has that standard in eight in her system that she goes out there only to win the title. She must be in shape to really be able to go the distance in a Grand Slam two weeks uh of uh, tough, tough matches. Again, she will not be seated in the top 10. She's now, I think, ranked around 22. So it's it's going to be a, a real test from the beginning for her. But this was nothing new last year either when she really wasn't in shape. She was eight weeks pregnant, 68 weeks pregnant, as we learned after the fact, and uh, had to really work her way into the tournament and work her way into her fitness, um, but was able to do it and pull it off in, in, in quite stellar form. So she can do it, Greg. She is the type of uh, phenomenal athlete, she, they, you know, the GOAT. She's the greatest of all time because she is able to transform herself so quickly. She's able to go to Wonder Woman uh, from Mach 0 to Mach 5 that fast. And uh, I think that uh, this is a great sign to get her on court, that if, you know, just to get her out of that sure. uh, routine of being home and being mom and get her back competing and get her back into the, getting the muscle memory back and the wheels in motion. Because once you do that with uh, Serena Gregg, then she gets tough. She, that killer instinct, that fighter in her comes out. Okay, now, is the reason she's here, though, is this important for Abu Dhabi to have her there because of all of the players who have dropped out, including on the women's side, uh, Vika? She's out. Well, well, Vika is pulled out of Auckland, um, and we'll get to Vika in a second. But this is a men's event. Uh, Nadal is pulled out. Rarinka, uh, Milos Ranić is pulled out. So, yes, they've lost a lot of big names. Obviously, they the men go there. It's a very lucrative ticket. There's obviously a lot of money there. Uh, it's not an official uh, point getter, but for, uh, it's very interesting that they decided to add Serena to the mix, add, add Cache to the event, bringing in the big name. I think it's very smart on the part of the tournament and Serena and her management company. Of course, they're so shrewd, they're so sharp, and she does not need to play a tournament, Greg. You do not want to put her in a regular tour event. You want to put her in an exhibition where you can control everything and you can really test, you know, where she is in her game without any pressure of any other element. You know, she doesn't have to do the pressure interview. She doesn't have to do the whole routine of playing a tour event. She can go in and play this one-time exhibition against a, a top-ten player. Austin Panko would be a great test for uh, Serena to see where she is. 
and uh, really gauge if she's ready for the Australian Open. I think if she plays well and she feels good and she feels the vibe and the momentum, she'll go for it. But, uh, you know, if she really feels that she's not in shape and cannot do so in the matter of 10 days, two weeks, obviously, then she'll probably say, you know what? I still have a ways to go. Um, but the ways to go will be probably not till Wimbledon in uh, the end of June. So that would take a, quite a big chunk of the year away from her because obviously playing the tour events is really not what she's looking at right now. It's just the Grand Slams. All right. So, uh, so, so Serena's at Abu Dhabi. Meanwhile, and before I, I, I go on to these other events, I want to ask you about some of the players that are withdrawn from some of the Australian Open tune-ups. What about the Australian Open and Serena? What, 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 what's your gut tell well, you? Well, you know, it's interesting. Serena, I think, had the most interesting comment herself. You know, they were talking to her about what it takes is it more of a mental or physical battle to get back into shape, to get back into, you know, that fighter competitive mode that you need to play professional tennis at this level? And uh, to me, it's, it's probably a combination of both for her. But uh, she had the interesting comment. She says, you know what? Um, you know, everyone keeps talking about this, you know, r runner's high you get after you exercise and, you know, mm -hmm. going through the process and working hard and you have, you know, you get this kind of high and you feel so good, the endorphins kind of kick in. And she says, I just don't feel that when I train. I don't, I don't get that. You know, she, she says, I really don't feel that. Sometimes I feel it after I've exercised, but while I'm out there and I'm training hard and working hard, it's, it's, there's no fun. And so this is someone, you know, we see a lot of competitors who love the process. You know, they love to get out there. They don't mind the hours. They don't mind the grind. They really feed off it. They thrive off it. She's not one of them. And quite frankly, either is Venus as well. They've never really liked having to put all those hours on court. So they've had to do quality rather quantity. Um, and she's had to grit her teeth and bear it sometimes, Serena, to get the physicality back. Because obviously that is the most... That's the biggest factor in her game, to be able to overpower the players, to you know, get some more balls, to hit those winners, and to have that arm for the serve. And uh, so to that degree, the physicality is very, very important. And, uh, you know, you're seeing now a lot of players who are having trouble, you know, going through the process again, you know, whether it's been a tough year or whether they're coming back from injury. Again, it's trying to get back into that routine. And some of them thrive on it, and some of them, like Serena, don't. And it's really all work. All right. Now, as far as some of the other events this week, you mentioned Brisbane. So Vika's out of Brisbane. Uh, and of course, so Vika's pulled out of Auckland. Um, actually, Vika pulled out of Auckland and she was given a wild card. We've talked about this and Vika is still, you know, in the ongoing custody battle over baby son Leo. Uh, this is now month going into month six almost. It was supposed to be resolved in October. And I think, Greg, that this is really a career factor here. Uh, you know, what happens in this, uh, this custody battle. Now, obviously, there are far more important things at stake. The custody of her child, that's her, it's a life decision, that's you know, her, her baby, and that has to come first. But obviously, this is impacting her career. If you look at week of the last five years, you know, the injuries first, you know, five years ago, for a couple years, she was really out with various injuries. Then uh, she came back. She had that fierce sunshine double winning uh, both Indian Wells and Miami and then got pregnant and has been out at this stage, you know, uh, well over um, a year and a half now. So you're going almost on two years, uh, you know, if you go into 2018 without playing. So, you know, this has been a lot of time off, and people feel that, uh, obviously, look, they hope she resolves the custody battle. You know, this, as they said, is a life issue, um, and these things happen all the time. They battle for custody all the time. Uh, she and her former partner, um, uh, um Billy McQuig are battling this out. But, uh, you know, the other is interesting point is she hasn't really replaced her coach, Michael Joyce, who had to you know, quit the team and go with Joe Conta. She has not apparently replaced her fitness trainer either who had to quit the team because obviously they don't know too many question marks for the future. And so no one really knows what kind of shape she's in. You know, is she tournament tough? Uh, people I know have seen her, they say she looks very cute and very slim and very trim and, and, and so forth. But does she have that physicality to play the game she's always played? And she did play with a lot of, you know, there's a lot of muscle behind her shots. There's a lot of ferocity behind her ground stroke. She, to me, was a, most similar to Monica Sellis in that she was able to take that ball on the rise and keep pounding and pounding those ground strokes and the opponent into the ground relentlessly. But that took a lot, a lot of timing, but also a lot of physicality. So it'll be interesting to see uh, on the two-parter whether she can even get out there 
because as we mentioned, there's going to have to be an adjustment of expectations no matter what the outcome. I don't think there's any way she's going to be able to travel with this baby full time. To go to the Australian, you're looking at three weeks. Uh, you know, Vika as a rank is a top name. You think she would certainly be in the second week, so you have to make expectations of that. So to get there a week early to train, to prepare properly, um, you know, this is a, a, a chunk of time. So even if she's allowed to do that or she decides that she's going to go anyway, uh, the, what shape will she be in when she gets there? So a um, lot of questions about her. We wish her the best. Obviously, everyone has circled the wagons with support for Vika. Everyone's heart goes out to her. But, uh, you know, the expectations are certainly going to have to be adjusted. All right. And uh, other players uh, that have withdrawn uh, for these upcoming events this week, uh, Nadal, Warinka, Raonic, Nishikori on the men's side, uh, also Sloan. Uh, now, is that is that a uh, an injury thing or just uh, uh, needing to get back in shape? She she needs some more time off thing for Sloan. Well, Sloan citing her knee. Now, of course, this knee was something she cited in Asia at the end of uh, this year. She in the fall, she did not do anything. We've mentioned did not win a match after the U.S. Open. Um, you know, obviously was part of the Fed Cup team, but also was not able to win. So, you know, she is citing a knee injury. She said she overcompensated for the foot injury and hurt the knee and whatever the case is. I think that Sloan is someone that actually um, is a little bit, you know, like the princess in the pea in traveling. You know, she doesn't travel as well. She likes her routine. She likes to be at home. She's not one of these that thrives on the competition. Uh, you got to pull her out of her, you know, pull her out of the cave, get her on the plane, and get her going. And once you get her going, uh, she's very good, as we saw at the U.S. Open and, and this summer and that spurt she had. But um, I'm hoping it's something she will be okay with and that she will get over there fully committed to her matches. Uh, Stan Rinka, two knee surgeries. Um, he's been more of a question mark. Andy Murray delayed his um, delayed his uh, you know trip to Brisbane because again he wasn't sure where he is at. Uh, Milos Ranich and Nisha Corey both have pulled out of their tune-up events and uh, saying that they need more time. So hopefully we're you know that will be it that they're just you know waiting for more time. But uh, obviously when you're not playing any tune-up tournament going into Melbourne, they're experienced, they're veterans, they can do it. But it's never the most uh, optimum situation. All right, uh, what's uh now move on to another uh, topic. What is going on with all this anti halop nonsense <laughs> that seems to be going on here? Because uh, I mean, it seems like she's being ganged up on, and I I don't I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, we're she, tired of Simona Halep being ganged up on. <laughs> we I don't mean, like it. She doesn't seem. <laughs> we she's have not a bad Simona case. Simona Halep all year, and we have uh, shown concern for some of this all year behind the scenes and on this program. And, uh, yeah, now, of course, it's uh, resulted in Adidas not re-signing her. Uh, she is the number one player in the world without apparently a clothing contract. Now, we don't know. We hope they're going to get the wheels in motion and pull something out of a hat before uh, Melbourne. But uh, right now, there's some con uh, question mark about it. And, uh, you know, obviously what has been reported is that they uh, went to Adidas with numbers that you would go to for a number one player in the world. And Adidas balked and they didn't have another plan in line. And so went back to Adidas and Adidas had already uh, spent their spent their wad, spent their money on players like Muguruza and uh, also Wozniacki and Ostapenko and Kerber and uh, a bunch of others. But it was really Muguruza that came into play and there was a lot of, a lot of uh, discussion behind the scenes as to, you know, what were the games played to perhaps build Muguruza up and, and maybe cut, uh, you know, cut Simona down to uh, parlay that into this Adidas deal. Um, I don't know about all that, Greg, but uh, what I do know is is that the health camp is going to be a very watchful now on all segments as to what is said and written about Simona and uh, I think that uh, she herself, though, seems to be in very good spirit. She just won an exhibition in Thailand. Uh, from what I have been told and heard is that she's in very good spirits, very relaxed. She stayed home in this off season, did not leave Romania. Of course, was fed it all over the country for all, uh, with all the accolades and praise and parties and so forth for her incredible success in being the first Romanian to finish the world number one. And uh, she was obviously has made a lot of money. So. She she's you know worth uh, I think she was actually named on the for, for the first time on Romania's uh, 
biggest earners of the year. So she's made millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars. So for her, she has more than enough money to live her life in great style. But uh, this is still a little bit of a chink uh, in the armor. Okay, so you're not buying then necessarily the <laughs> conflict between the WTA website, the people who work for the WTA website that also work with Muguruza's people. You, you, that's not you, that's a coincidence in your mind, or I mean, if you were yeah. Simona Halves people, you you would be a little bit. I mean, this isn't one of those conspiracies. This is actually like you know, well, you know, oh yeah, you're you're a little crazy thinking about some sort of crazy conspiracy. This this sounds actually kind of real to me. This, I mean, you know, I don't know how far it goes. Nobody knows. I understand that, and I understand what they're trying to do for Muguruza's people, but. Uh, at the expense of another person, you know, I mean... Well, that's the whole key, at the expense of another person. I mean, obviously, Muguruza's team's got to build her up, get her the most yeah, money, sure, do the best exactly. job for her. Yes. So we don't, we, you know, of course, they, and, and she deserves a lot. Let's face it, she got to number one this year for, albeit not the year end, but she won Wimbledon, and she deserves a lot, too. But she got those numbers. She got the money from Adidas, apparently. And uh, look, I, I'm a believer in consistency, and I'm also a believer the WTA website has to, is, is promoting its players. It's there to promote. It's there to put their best foot forward. It's there to uh, build them up and be positive. It's not there to demonize any athlete or any player. And the players are paying these people to put this on the website. It's their money. They're the ones who decide, have discretion as to where these funds are put forward. And they don't need someone uh, being negative about them who they're, you know, who they're supporting. So, yeah, I think the WTA has to be very, very cognizant of this moving forward. Um, yes, everyone now knows that their social media is being run by IMG, uh, IMG related, uh, firm, uh, that does, uh, work for Muguruza and others, Sharapova. So that's no secret anymore. All the players know it. Um, but I think that's even more reason where they have to be above board, very professional and making sure that all the top players, all the players, period, are treated equally and consistently and, posit and positively. And this is not just a free-for-all for, you know, someone to go on there and write whatever they want. That's not the way it works. And there do need to be boundaries, and there do does need to be a, a balance and check system in place. Um, you know, look, the W chain named Muguruza as their player of the year. Of course, that was before uh Singapore, but neither of them did well in Singapore. Sure, sure. They didn't know that Halep was going to be the year end number one and uh but they instead still chose to make Muguruza the player of the year. The ITF uh named Muguruza their player of the year, again disregarding the rankings, disregarding the computer system, um, which is a reflection of the results. Uh, Muguruza, quite frankly, you know, yes, yeah, she won Wimbledon, and the ITF, which is focusing on the Grand Slam results, maybe has a little bit more merit to that, sure. um, their decision. But, uh, you know, look, her record and her disposition half the time she walked out there was, you know, no different than in, than Halps or anyone else's. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that um, that she, she's been given the puff balls. Uh, you know, we saw the WCA do a nice little – get some snippets from an interview they did with her a, a week or so ago, and they edited it very well to make it look a little slicker than the first raw, uh, raw unedited um, tape that was put out there on social media, which was not too terrific. But they did a great job editing it. She looked good. They used it well. It was positive. The questions were fine because they were puff questions, as they should be. But Halep is also a, should be afforded the same treatment. And Halep should also not be interrogated or questioned or undermined in any way. So, yes, we support Simona Halep. We go to bat for her. We went to the mat for her this year. Um, and uh, I think that also she, in, in some respect, though, has to be sensitive about this relationship she has with uh, Ily Nastasi. Uh, there were multiple pictures of her dancing with Ily in one of these celebrations in Romania a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is someone she reveres. It's a cultural issue. Obviously, this is a hero in Romania. Uh, they have a difference in how they look upon his comments and his totally inappropriate, uh, unacceptable behavior regarding uh, Serena Williams and Joe Conta earlier this year at the Fed Cup match. Um, but, uh, you know, this is something where people aren't going to point to it, Greg, but it's in the back. You know, it's in the background. And, and of course, Tyriac has a very adversarial uh, relationship with the WTA as well. And so all these things will not be 
said up front, but you have to feel like they're haunting uh, in the back scene. You know, that all, right, all well, kind of put a little bit of a cloud on Halep. Well, we'll uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on it. We won't let anybody get away with anything here. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing, though. Halep is in Shenzhen, and she is playing great tennis. And she beat Pushkova, Pushkova and she beat uh, Kanta in this exhibition, and she looked great. She's playing her tennis. Uh, to me, I did watch both matches, and... Um, to me, she looks like she's playing her brand of tennis. She looks very relaxed. She looks very casual. And her coach, Darren Cahill, looks a lot more relaxed this year. You know, I think this has been just as much about his evolving as a coach as Simona becoming number one. And I think that he has learned a lot of lessons himself in the last year and how to approach this. And uh, he looks much more relaxed. Of course, his family's with him. Simona's mother is traveling with her. They have also added a communications rep to her team who will be traveling with her now full-time. All this is good, Greg. All this is good because I think it adds better balance to this. I think, you know, as we mentioned, Austin Penko took a coach for David Taylor for 18 weeks. And I really believe that these, you know, to put these players and coaches out there for 30, 40 weeks um, a year together is too much. It burns them both out. Sure. And they both get, you know, it's just too much of uh, – too much on the carrying on the shoulders of all the burdens of the emotional baggage. And so I think it's great to temper this, to bring in more people, to create a better balance. I'm, I think it's great for Simona. Her mother is there to keep her spirit high, to keep her confidence in check. And I think it's great for, you know, Darren to have his family and, you know, have a, you know, someone else to vent on other than, you know, have to be at these tournaments on his own. All right, now some quick tournament updates. Uh, you, you've got, uh, let's see, three, Miami, Stanford, and Memphis. Miami, what's well, going on Well, we mentioned my, the Miami Open finally got approval. It will move to the Miami uh, Dolphin Stadium uh, in 2019, so uh, this coming year is the last year in Key Biscayne. Okay. Uh, every, I think it's a great move. I mean, everyone has their own opinion. Uh, yes, Key Biscayne used to be a terrific uh you know, setting for the tournament to right on the water, but uh, they needed an infusion of creativity, of marketing, of sales, and of money. And uh, they needed to reinvent this event. It had been run right into the ground. And I think Stephen Ross and his team uh, over at that stadium are going to do that. Uh, they're going to invest uh, a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars, to build this new site and uh, really make it the top-notch event it used to be, and it should be. So to me, as we said, we hope this is the comeback player of the year, this coming year, one of them, uh, because this is really one of the top. This used to be the, considered the fifth the, you know, the fifth Grand Slam, because that's how big it was sure. at one point. Yeah. And it used to even compete with the U.S. Open. It's one of the biggest tournaments in the U.S. So uh, we hope it regains its glamour, and uh, that's great. Stanford um, is a smaller event on the WTA Tour. It's moving from Stanford. It's out of Stanford. It is supposedly moving to San Jose. They apparently do have a sponsor, so it will stay in that Northern Cal um, you know, area, but uh, supposedly moving to San Jose. And Memphis will move to New York? Memphis is going. It's called the New York Open. It's in Long Island at Nassau Coliseum. And uh, it'll be interesting. They've gotten, they spent a lot of money. They've gotten a lot of top players. Isner's going, Sox going, Misha Corey's going, uh, the Bryan boys. And uh, so, they, you know, it's a smaller event, but uh, they have some great names. You know, obviously the question mark is, is Long Island uh, near uh, President's Day weekend, where it's usually pretty cold, pretty chilly, pretty snowy. Um, it'll have some challenges. But, uh, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see how that works. All right. Now, uh, coming up, starting on the 30th, will be the Hopman Cup in Perth. Uh, uh, that's so uh, you get some men and women playing there. You've got uh, the Brisbane for both the men and the women uh, starting on New Year's Eve Day. And you also have China on the women's side starting on New Year's Eve Day. And then on the men's side, you've got Doha and Auckland starting on New Year's Day. But Brisbane is the top event, correct? Well, I think that's a top tour event, um, you know, especially with the women. You have Muguruza going there. We have to mention that that first, number one ranking is in play this first week of the year. Uh, okay. Halep is going to Shenzhen. Uh, Radwanska has pulled out of there, and Bouchard pulled out. I, I just saw that Bouchard has entered the Hotman Cup. Uh, he'll, she'll team with Papasol. Um, But, uh, yeah, I mean, Wozanaki is going to Auckland, and she is uh, just a matter of, uh, you know, less than the uh, – you know, around 100 points away, of course. So there's only a 60-point difference between Muguruza and Halep. So you have very small margins there at the top. Pushkova will be playing uh, in Brisbane. 
And so that number one ranking is in play. There's no question about it. And uh, that's what is going to be so exciting right from the very beginning of the year. Your girl, Coco, was teaming with Jack Sock at the Hotman Cup. Of course, the big uh, attraction will be Roger Federer. Uh, he is going to be teaming with, you know, up and rising star Belinda Bencic again, former top 10 player coming back from injury and has won 15 matches in a, r- in a row, including a couple of titles to now move into the top 75. But she will uh, uh, team with Roger. So uh, Sasha Zarev is playing for Germany with Kerber. So that'll be very, a very exciting event, a lot of fun. But as you mentioned, we're going to be watching the tour events to see uh, really how these players who have been out for a while do. Maria Sharapova will be in Shenzhen as well. So she's ranked 59. You know, she wants to get that ranking up uh, as much as she can before Melbourne. All right. So don't forget, next week when we're on the air, uh, we will be on air pretty much right around uh, midweek of these events. So we'll be able to get you ready before uh, next weekend and take a look at how everybody uh, has started their 2018 campaigns. Now let's get to uh, Facebook fan uh, Facebook fan questions. And uh, this is when you get an opportunity, Andrea, to answer uh, weekly questions uh, from everybody that uh, checks out your Facebook page. Uh, and let's go first of all to Lisa in Dallas who wants to know why is there so much confusion over whether top players like Serena, uh, Andy, and Rafa will play? Um, well, I think that everyone just assumed that they had been out for so long that they'd be healthy by now and mm-hmm. ready to go. I mean, Andy Murray is, you know, uh, not played since, uh, losing to, uh, Query and Wimbledon and, you know, but, uh, and of course, uh, Serena, uh, looked like she was, you know, jumping, had the bit to get back on the court as soon as she could have her baby. And then, of course, that things have taken a little bit longer. And the process, look, of getting, I think, getting married, uh, having uh, that wedding, which took, a, you know, time to prepare. And then a honeymoon afterwards was, a, you know, three or four weeks there where she lost time in the training. And that's really what set her schedule back, um, both mentally and physically. But, you know, I think the players, a lot of fans wonder, you know, why isn't Stan ready? You know, he had his two surgeries. He's been training because I think they take the model of Roger. And Roger was out six months. And Roger trained. Roger did everything perfectly as Mr. Perfect always does. I call him Mr. Perfect now. And he came back with vengeance and, and uh, won the Australian Open. So I think they were hoping that he, you know, the players, that these players would live up to their commitments too. And in reality, uh, things just don't always work that way. And not everyone's Roger. Um, so there are things that were out of their control and things where they just don't feel physically 100%. But, you know, I think that's where a little bit of the confusion is that they just do not feel ready yet. And I always say to players, if you don't think or feel or, you know, 100%, don't play. If uh, you are ready to, you know, bring out the excuses, don't go. Are the tours or the players themselves with social media today – because uh, if you're a fan of a specific player, of course, you're going to follow them on Twitter. If they've got a website, you're going to go there. Now, how much the player or, say, the player agent, uh, PR people, how much that they uh, convey what's going on with the player on a daily basis? Now, of course, that's up to them. So do you think that it's uh, there's any responsibility as far as the players, the management team, or the tour itself to keep the fans updated more often on what's going on when the players just don't seem like they're playing and they're hurt? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I do agree with you. I think there can be more communication about this. You know, usually you hear the banner the headlines when the player enters something or they're getting ready to go, and it's the little in the fine print where you see the ones they're pulling out. You know, they don't make a big deal about it because, quite frankly, it hurts the tournament and their ticket yeah. sales, so they don't like to promote that. But, um you know, I, I think that in the beginning of the year, the, the issue is, Greg, is, you know, can you play Melbourne? And uh, you have so few weeks to get ready. You're only talking about two weeks to get yeah. you know, ready for this Grand Slam, whereas the other Grand Slams, you have so much more time. Yep. The French Open has, what, almost two months of clay court yeah. events. Um, the U.S. Open has an entire summer. Wimbledon, okay, not as much. But, um, you know, they've been playing all summer in Europe. Um so this is where you have to get the, the motor running fastest in the quickest uh, amount of time. And, uh, look, I remember when I played, we used to have Australia at the end of the year in December. Um, and uh, so you played at the end tail of everything, and you were ready to go, and there was never an issue. Um, and then they moved it, of course, to, to January in the beginning of, to start the year. And um, I think that it's a, a question of how the players have managed their off season, And some of them have done a better job than others. Uh, 
Look, to me, um, we haven't talked about uh, one guy a lot, and to me, I think he could. He may end up winning the Australian Open, and that's Nick Kyrgios. I think that he has had one of the best off-seasons of anyone. You want to know why? He's back with Isla. You know, the world can now rest at ease, and you know, Nick Kyrgios has won over Isla, his girlfriend, once again, and he has had to circle the globe following her around to get her back uh, since his bad behavior at Wimbledon, which caused the breakup. But the interesting part is he's become kind of like this superhero now. He's formed this foundation. He's giving all this money to uh, build this for kids so they have a place to go, kids in need, kids who need the support and so forth. And so he has this whole charitable element now, but he also apparently is actually not only just going to the gym, but actually working out in the gym now. So he's getting into better shape. He's in better condition. He's obviously in a better routine with Isla there, okay. who's this very pretty girl who plays on the women's tour who's coming back from her own shoulder surgery. Very, couldn't ask for a nicer person. And uh, she's had been a very good influence on him and his attitude and his approach, and he's been far more professional. He's putting together a charitable exhibition with Novak before in Melbourne, before the uh, event starts. So he's trying to do all the right things. And as we know, Greg, when Nick Kyrgios does all the right things, he's very dangerous. Yes, (laughs) sounds like uh, somebody that we might want to be uh, keeping an eye on early for the Australian Open. Maybe uh, maybe I'll throw a few bucks on Nick Kyrgios to win the Australian Open. And And, of course, he could break up in a week and then my money could get flushed in the toilet. But as long as his relationship's going well, like you said, then... Uh, well, she just got a wild card into one of the Australian tournaments. So, uh, you know, this is a good relationship for them. Cool. And, uh, you know, look, he's very taken with her, and she's the nicest gal you'll ever meet. And so I, I'm glad that he has that, you know, good influence in his life and something to play for. And let us let me tell you one thing about, it, as we know now, about Nick Kyrgios. When Nick Kyrgios wants to put his the gears in motion, yep. he is ferociously determined. Yeah. I mean, and he was determined to get her back. Now, if he could just channel that into his tennis, I can only imagine the title he would be winning. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, I know we talked last year about uh, the – now, again, I don't, I don't remember exactly what were we talking about, the, them actually making changes to uh, players who were backing out of events – uh, so that doesn't happen. Well, there was there is a change in uh, you know a lot of the men were pulling were going onto court at the Grand Slams and and then having to uh, retire yeah. injured so they could get their first round prize money or, or so forth. And so they did put a new rule in place that said if you pulled out and did not play the first round and let a lucky loser go in or you know qualifier go in that you would get half the prize money. And, uh, okay. and, uh, you know, and so forth. So you would not be, you would not lose financially completely out of that, but do the right thing and not go into court injured. Okay. All right. Another question from Terrence in Italy. What is different with Roger this year from last year? Because Terrence just hasn't heard much about him lately. Well, can you believe he's been overshadowed? And that's because there's been so much talk about Novak Djokovic and he's got Andre Agassi. He's got, um, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of team around him now. And, of course, he just – I just watched last night his videotape of his working out. And, Greg, he's doing all the right things. You know, he had to reset his body. He had to go back and do it the old-fashioned way of working out, grinding away. And uh, he has been putting in the time. He has been training I mean, so hard. I mean, I'm watching these tapes of him. And uh, he just looks in phenomenal shape. And as we all know – Novak, uh, when he's at his best, is probably the best. Yep. So it'll be interesting to see how Roger responds to this, because even at the end of our last show, we mentioned that Ivan Lubacic is apparently joined a management company, SAM, where he's going to be managing Chorich now. Um, and so he's going to be doing double duty, apparently, coaching Roger, I, I assume, and also now managing. Uh, it was interesting that he did not go with teammate Roger's management company. He did go with this one in his homeland. And, uh, so, you know, there are a few things that we're starting to see. Uh, I think that Roger also um, has the expectation of being the defending champion, but he was not put in the promotional um, videos, uh, tape games of for the Australian Open. They put Rafa Nadal because he's uh, end of the year at number one. Okay. So a little bit of a snub there. So, um, you know, we, we aren't hearing a lot from Roger right now. And I think, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how he responds to all this and all the attention given to others as he has commanded the entire stage in the last year. All right, last question. Carrie from Australia wants to know which player do you think has had the best off season then? 
It's not Roger. So who, and you, maybe it's Novak. Uh, maybe it's I think Nick it's Curios. Novak. I think <laughs> Novak has used the time. I think he is, you know, right to the grindstone as far as what he needed to do. I think Andre Agassi put it to him, and he's been there before. He's done it. He knows the drill, and I think there couldn't have been a better advisor for Novak than Andre Agassi. And uh, I think that they spent some time together in L.A. in California and put the game plan together. And, they, and he said, this is what you have to do. Either do it or don't do it. But this is if you want me on board, you know, do it. And so that is exactly what Novak is, um, uh, has been doing in Monte Carlo. And uh, I, I agree. I think he's had the best offseason for the women. I thought Pliskova looked a little bit better in her exhibition. Austin Panko has had no offseason. She has been doing one promotional appearance after another. Uh, Muguruza is fit and disciplined and ready to go. She's been in uh, her L.A. Her brother went with her when she uh, was uh, training in her preseason in L.A. Um, so she she looks good to go. I think Wozanaki has been doing a lot of photo shoots and a lot of everything else, but that's okay for Caroline, uh, who's still trying to vie for number one. To me, the person who looks the best is still Simona Halep. Um, I okay. think that she looks fit uh, and she looks relaxed and she looks like she's very comfortable in her skin. It goes back to the quote we ran in our last show where in her, her own words, Simona says that she has learned to trust herself, her own instincts, to believe in herself, not to let her confidence be you know, swayed in any way and to keep believing. And to me, that's what I saw in court uh, this past week in Thailand. Um, so if she can keep that up, I think she's going to be pretty tough this time around. All right, Andrea. Uh, as we close up, uh, a couple things quickly. Uh, first of all, this is our last show of the 2017 calendar year. So uh, I just wanted to say it was uh, a lot of fun uh, being educated uh, once again by you for the year <laughs> in tennis. And uh, I just know that 2018 is going to be that much better. Uh, that's going to be our third year already, if you can believe it. So it's going wow. by fast. It's uh, going by so fast, Greg. I can't even imagine. Yeah, we got a, we got so many. I remember when we first started, we were like, well, we got to try to build up a live. We got to build up some shows. Now it's like we got like a million shows. We got so many shows built up in our library. We have over two million uh, uh, listeners, so uh, it's been great. We appreciate the Facebook support. We appreciate all the uh, social media support. It's been a phenomenal uh, response. Um, and yeah, Greg, I, I thank you. I mean, uh, every week it's been it's so much fun to do this. You and make it a lot of fun. I appreciate that. And also, we want to uh, send out our condolences to the Dick Enberg family uh, because Dick absolutely. Enberg did some great tennis coverage, especially all those Wimbledon some years ago. So it wasn't just football, and and, and Dick Enberg definitely had uh, his mark in tennis. He did. He was the model. He was a gracious uh, man, a gentleman, and uh, just always, always treated everyone incredibly well. I, I, uh, it's a big loss, but um, salute to him, yeah. All right, Andrea. We'll uh, see you again in 2018. Look forward to a break. Thanks so much. All right. That'll wrap it up here. Don't forget to check out all our on-demand shows, that library of shows I just mentioned. Available on our website at primesportsnetwork.com, or you can go to our iTunes page or YouTube pages under Prime Sports Network. And make sure to check in with us next week, our first show of the 2018 calendar year. Thanks again for tuning in to Prime Sports Tennis with Andrea Leanne on the Prime Sports Radio Network.